Well, anyway, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate uh, all of you who have uh, uh, toughed it out for to this part of the event. I think you're going to be very uh, pleased that you uh, stayed here to hear our next panel that I have the pleasure of introducing. Um, my name is Lancey Zooming. I'm the Senior Director of the Center for Education at the Pacific Research Institute. And I'm pleased to say that I'll be celebrating my 30th year here at PRI in April. So PRI turns 45 this year, and I'll be here 30. So uh, a good a chunk of that time. Perhaps the best thing about that, I've spent almost all of that time with our president and CEO, Sally Pipes. So yeah. anyway, uh, I want to first of all uh, thank the members of the previous panel. The, each one of them actually have a special part in my heart. Uh, Brigadier General uh, Spano, I uh, was a, actually a commissioned officer in the State Guard for five years, so I really appreciate his service, uh, you know, so well, it was great to have somebody from my, my branch out here. And then also the district attorneys who've been here, I actually uh, spent a good chunk of my time after I got out of law school uh, with the L.A. County district attorneys before you know who took over. <laughs> and so, um, but anyway... Uh, one of the things that I think is really important, I think this is a great panel to follow up on the previous panel, is that uh, when you talk about crime, well, and uh, I think we had a, a question from somebody who said, well, where does that all come from? Well, a lot of it is because of poor education, right? I mean, uh, a lot of those uh, people end up uh, as criminals because they got a lousy education. And uh, as you know, uh, I've written many books during my time here at PRI, in fact, the, the latest book that I, I have out is called The Great Parent Revolt, How Parents and Grassroots Leaders Are Fighting Critical Race Theory in America's Schools. And I'm very pleased to say that I have a new book that I'm working on right now uh, that will be released sometime this spring, and it's entitled The Great Classroom Collapse, and it details the implosion of academic rigor in math and reading in America's schools. And here in California, this classroom collapse is especially appalling. Uh, we heard from our own Wayne Weingarten about, uh, you know, the increase in uh, uh, spending uh, in various areas here in California. Uh, well, in, that's especially the case here in education in California. You look back in 2019, state spending on education was about $79 billion, all right? That's a lot of money, but you take uh, the proposed budget that the governor has just put forward today, just a few years later, he's proposing to spend $109 billion. So 35% more than what he spent just a few years ago. And the question is, uh, what have we gotten for all that money? Uh, last year, two thirds of California students taking the state math test failed to score at grade level. In reading, a majority of students failed to score at grade level. California's results on, are even worse on the National Assessment for Educational Progress which is routinely called the nation's report card. If you look at our results in mathematics, more than three quarters of eighth graders here in California failed to score at the proficient level. In reading, seven out of 10 California eighth graders failed to score at the proficient level. Now, the question, which uh, we hope to answer in uh, this book that I'm writing right now, uh, The Great Classroom Collapse, is why? Why are we seeing that? Despite all of that money, why are we seeing that? And um, for, to get those answers, I interview students, parents, private tutors, and public school teachers in order to find out why student achievement has gone through the floor in math and reading. Their stories reveal ideologically driven standards, poor curriculum, and ineffective instructional methods that combine to impede the performance of our children. It is therefore with great pleasure that I am joined today by three amazing people whom I profile in my new book. Uh, they will tell you about their experiences in math and reading, give you an important insight into why so many California children cannot do math and cannot read. So let me introduce them in the order in which they are going to speak. First, I have with me, um, I want to welcome Sugi Sorensen who is a senior systems engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's also a private math instructor for a math enrichment firm in the Los Angeles suburb of La Cañada Flint Ridge. He's also the president of La Cañada Math Parents, a parent math advocacy group in the La Cañada Unified School District. He's taught mathematics and coached students in mathematic competitions in the La Cañada district since 2014, and his children attend school in the La Cañada district. Next, we have Michael Malioni, 
who has served the East Bay and Marin as an independent STEM enrichment tutor since 2015. In recent years, he's grown a clientele of younger students who've come to, see, come to him seeking greater challenge and more explicit instruction in their math studies. He's seen the failings of currently popular teaching approaches firsthand, and he aims to bring truly effective math education to the widest possible audience. And he's been active since 2021 in calling for more traditional approaches to math education. And he, I would also mention, graduated first in his class at uh, San Francisco's Lowell High School and uh, concentrated on chemistry and physics at Harvard, went on to earn a master's degree in electrical engineering at Stanford. And last but certainly not least, we have Rebecca Sinclair. Uh, Rebecca graduated from Cornell University with a degree in economics. She's a former shareholder activist who specialized in corporate governance at publicly traded companies. Uh, today, she is an educational researcher, a writer, and proud mother of four young children who attend public school in Orange County. Uh, I am pleased to say that uh, Becca and I will be co-authoring an article on the controversial topic of social emotional learning very soon. Uh, and we're also pleased to have Becca's mom, Cheryl Milnes, here at, in the audience. So thank you, Cheryl, for coming here today. And with that, I would like to have Sugi Sorensen come up and uh, start off uh, our presentations uh, talking about math instruction in California. Thank you, Lance. Um, so I'm going to go over, um, Lance has actually hit the high points, but uh, how the kids are doing uh, in K through 12 and public education in California. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, then Michael's going to talk about um, what's the cause, what are we doing wrong, and he's going to have some suggestions on how we can fix things. So how are we doing? The bottom line, um, if you look at the standardized achievement tests, um, Lance talked about the NAEP and the uh, state CASP scores. I'll go over and explain what those are. Um, we're not doing well, and we haven't been doing well for as long as the standardized tests have been taken. And then one of the themes we're going to hit on um, a couple of times is that there's actually a two-tiered system of math education that's going on. So the, both Michael and I are involved in teaching kids supplemental math because the schools don't do a good job at it. Um, so the hidden problem is that there are students who need tutoring and enrichment in order to succeed, particularly those that are aiming for selective colleges, the quantitative and STEM fields. Uh, so the, the two data points I'm going to look at, the National Assessment of Educational Progress is also called the Nation's Report Card. So this is a standardized test conducted every two years. They use a sampling method of between 10 and 20,000 students across the United States. They look at grades 4, 8, and 12. Um, I'm also going to show you the state standardized test scores in mathematics. Um, called the California Annual Assessment of Student Progress and Performance. Um, it's also called CASP. Uh, that's only been in place since 2015. Some of you who raised children earlier might remember the STAR system, so CASP replaced the STAR system. Um, so let's get into the data. So this shows the uh, grade 8 mathematics scores, the national averages in black at the top for the last 23 years. California is in gold, so the scale goes from 0 to 500, and the rough order of uh, rule of thumb is that 10 scale score points e equates to about one year of learning. So we've lagged uh, the national average for as long as this test has been in existence. Um, digging down into the, the NAEP scores, um, I'm just going to skip through these things, but I just wanted to show you this shows the last three testing periods. And compared to the United States, the key takeaway here is that, as Lance said, three quarters of California students in eighth grade are below proficient or advanced. Um, looking at our state standardized testing scores, uh, they, they divide up the performance of students into four performance levels. The, the bottom is the, the orange is um, that's below standard, they call it standard not met. It's also called level four. The, the middle, it's like a mustard color, is a 
still standards not met, they call it, they give them these nice euphemisms, they call it nearly met <laughs> instead of below grade level. <laughs> and then uh, the green is meets the standards are met and blue is standards exceeded. So the way that they usually report these scores is they take the blue and the green, they combine them together and they say, how many students or what percentage are at or above grade level? So they usually like to present it this way. If you go to the State Department of Education, you'll see notice the takeaway on the right shows mathematics. Only 30% of eighth graders are meeting or exceeding the state standards in math. Um, this problem is actually worse because as you go up in grade, you'll notice by 11th grade that's declined to almost only a quarter of students are meeting grade level standards. These standards are not very high. Um, a lot of you will probably be uh, who have kids that are in school will find that your kids are um, reaching the maximum score. So these don't test like how far above grade level, they're minimal standards. Um, this shows that these are, this is a snapshot of the scores from last spring. So these are the top two um, standards exceeded and standard met. So notice it starts out bad in third grade on the left less than half, only 45% are meeting grade level standards. And naturally, as you progress in grade, it gets worse down to only a quarter by 11th grade. For however bad it is for students on average, it's worse in certain racial and ethnic groups. So these are the racial categories that the Department of Education tracks. Um, I put it in a graphic form so it's easier to see. So at the top, this shows that same data that was on the previous page where blue is exceeding grade standard, green is met, and then what I've done is I've centered them in the middle. So you can see there are large disparities. Um, Asians at the top over half are performing in the top standards exceeded group. This is eighth grade math. Um, and then our black and brown students, uh, the African American, we have just the opposite. We have uh, we're down to 68% or two thirds are in that bottom tier. So these uh, distribution curves are shifted. You'll see the same kind of performance results in any kind of standardized test. You'll see it SAT, ACT, LSAT, MCAT. So I just wanted to point out that for however bad it is on average, it's worse for certain minorities. So how did we get here? Um, as you'll see, California has consistently been at the back of the nation. And I also wanted to highlight that the policy response to COVID um, has been catastrophic. Um, there have literally been years of, of gains, slow steady gains have been wiped out in just two years because of the policy response. A lot of people like to say due to COVID, it wasn't due to COVID, it was due to the policy response of keeping kids out of school. So remind, uh, just as a reminder, Remember, three-fourths, according to NAEP, of eighth graders were um, below proficient. Seventy percent, according to our state test scores, were below grade level standards. Um, this, uh, the average for the nation is in light blue. California is in dark blue. This goes back even further to 1990. You can see California is always trailed. Now, this graph, what I've done is I've looked at two years. 2019 is in dark blue. And I've rank ordered the performance of the states from the left is Massachusetts, which is the highest performing state. And California is in green in 42nd out of 50 states plus District of Columbia and the Department of Defense Educational Agency. Yellow is just where they are in the middle. Now remember for NAEP, 10 points reflects roughly one year. So the difference between the lowest state, Alabama, and Massachusetts at the high is about two and a half years of instruction. So that shows how disparate performance results are. The light blue dots show what happened in 2022. Notice that every single state, except for the Department of Defense Educational Agency, saw a drop in performance. Um, and some of these drops were uh, tremendous. So going back to this graph, from those last two data points, Basically, nationally, we wiped out 22 years of gains through the pandemic. It wasn't as bad in California, it was only 17 years. 
<laughs> you see the same thing in the state test results. So here we're looking at CASP, which is the state standardized test. This is fourth grade math. Um, five years of growth were wiped out since it was first done, uh, taken in 2015. This is eighth grade. We, we regressed to below where we even started measuring. Um, and then another thing to note here is notice that after kids were back in school for a year, there wasn't much improvement. So the, re the so-called recovery was pretty much non-existent in eighth grade. So where did we go wrong? <coughs> um, problems have been around for decades. Um, after the response to Sputnik in 1957, we had a movement called New Math. That did not go very well, but what it did was it opened the door for a bunch of progress uh, progressive education ideas to return to favor. So I'm talking about progressive education in the line of um, Horace Mann and uh, um, James Kilpatrick going back to the late 19th century where things are student-centered. So discovery-based learning instead of direct instruction. Michael's gonna talk more about this. The key organization to keep in mind here that's I think a culprit for where we are is the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. So this is an organization of math instructors, not mathematicians. And they're in charge of defining what the curriculum should be for pre-college students. So the worst of the documents they came up with was this 1989 standard. Um, and it emphasized, um, they thought that students would, need, students would not need to do calculations anymore, that we would have calculators. So they encouraged calculator use starting in kindergarten. They talked about emphasizing conceptual understanding and problem solving in, instead of knowing how to do and understand mathematics. And of course, California immediately adopted these recommendations with a 1992 framework and parents didn't stand by. This led to what's called the math wars in the 1990s. Some of you may be veterans of that when you saw your students weren't being taught uh, a couple, the only thing I want to say here is that the, the results of the change in 1992 and these 1989 NCTM standards were devastating. Test scores stagnated, instructional co uh, quality was gutted, and parents responded by forming grassroots organizations. And that led to actually a period of about 14 years where we actually did things right in California. So this was in 1997. We had uh, four Stanford math professors wrote our first math standards because the one that the education establishment created was found to have be riddled with errors. Um, and the most important thing it did was it put, incorporated what was called algebra for all. So algebra one by eighth grade. And it was remarkably successful Within that 14 year span, the percentage of students taking Algebra 1 went from 16%, increased fourfold to 67%. Um, there were downstream effects. So students taking higher math in high school also increased um, orders of magnitude. Well, not orders of magnitude, but several times. The graphs on the right show that this is the percentage of successful takers of AP Calculus but it's broken down by racial groups. The thing I wanted to point out here is that black and Latino students improved faster than other groups during this period from 1997 to 2013. I'll skip that one. But bafflingly in 2010, we reversed course. And what happened was the Common Core State Standards were approved in California and it resurrected a lot of these failed constructivist instructional methods. Um, that had been put aside in the math wars. So as a result, I told you the percentage of students taking algebra one um, had increased within four years that dropped to 19%. Um, the, math, the remediation rates at several of our university systems um, went up or started to go back up until they forced them to stop giving admissions tests. So uh, that's one thing you'll find in common is that if the test results are bad enough, what they do is they lobby to get rid of the tests. <laughs> so <laughs> we're still living with the misguided um, decisions by the State Board of Education 
to switch to the Common Core standard. So now Michael's going to go into what we're doing wrong. Right. So um, my presentation will include two parts. What are we doing wrong now and how can we fix it? And um, regarding what we're doing wrong now, it's a continuation of where Sugi left off, that even though we adopted excellent math standards in 1997, um, the teacher culture refused to turn back. So math performance improved primarily because there were standardized tests they had to teach to the test. But these fuzzy math materials from the Math Wars era did not go away. The methods just sort of continued to be taught underground. And then when Common Core uh, was, let's see, oh, so um, the, the two elements here I'm going to get into are how, it's, how instruction is determined, and that's where I'm going now, showing about Common Core and some of the processes in the State Board of Education. And then um, in particular, the 2022, 2023 California Math Framework, which is the most recent uh, gaffe of theirs, which is really, that's what we're doing wrong now. We just adopted this thing, and it's, it's going to take us back to the 1992 problems. So, um, so Common Core um, basically undid uh, a lot of the progress that had been made with the, the standards that were adopted earlier. And uh, they brought these teaching methods back out into the open. So most California school districts implemented Common Core between 2015 and 2018 with bland and bloated textbooks that covered the material much more slowly, lots of exercises asking young students to verbally explain their thinking and draw lots of pictures with dots and just excessiveness. Um, so Common Core delayed teaching the traditional pencil and paper arithmetic, which you all probably remember doing you know, on paper multiplication, addition, and so forth, until after third grade. So none of that even started officially, although some, some schools could teach it earlier because the standards are just minimal. Um, and, and even though third grade students are still expected to know their single digit multiple multiplication facts from memory, many teachers continued the practice, which started in the, ma in the Math Wars days, of steering students away from memorizing. Uh, with certain research claims that memorizing was unnecessary and even harmful to students because they claimed it would cause anxiety. Um, but the, the biggest wrong I've ever seen in California's math education policy is, is this 2023. Um, oh, oh, yeah, here's, here's a slide just indicating the things that were wrong with Common Core. Um, the biggest wrong I've ever seen is the 2023 California math framework. And... Uh, I became an advocate and started three years ago, um, I formed the Save Math Group to oppose this framework. When I learned about it, I saw the first draft and saw how bad it was. Um, so problems with the Common Core framework we're going to see, with the, sorry, with the California Math Framework, um, this new one. Now, the last one, 2013, went with Common Core. It already was starting a downward trend, as we saw with the trends in taking algebra. But um, this one just continues to double down on everything. So bad teaching and learning approaches, similar to, to Lucy Calkins' idea of balanced literacy, that we're not going to teach methods and procedures. It's all going to be discovery driven. But in addition to that, there's conflicts of interest with data science courses, poor validity and misrepresentation of the cited research. This one really slips through the cracks because you've got a thousand page document and the State Board of Education is saying, look, this is great. It's all airtight. There's research, but it's, it's bad research. But yet somehow <laughs> no one's really calling that out except for parent groups who really aren't getting a lot of air yet. Uh, disavowal of San Francisco Unified's failed experiment where they, 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 say, they claimed it was detracking, though they had already detracted prior to that with Algebra for All. So this is really going from a, an advanced stance to a falling back a year and putting everyone into no algebra until ninth grade. Uh, the claim was that it would improve equity. There were some statistics that, that they showed claiming it did, but they turned out to not be reproducible. Um, they've never been st substantiated to this day, even though the, the district did continue to promote them and has, has still to this day writing books claiming their success. One of the problems with the new framework is that it, it tries to get rid of Algebra 1 in 8th grade. And if you don't have Algebra 1 in 8th grade, you can't get to calculus in 12. And there's kind of this desire to move calculus to college because the idea uh, on the part of these educators is that it's inequitable. 
if, if some people get to calculus, you know, in high school and others don't, and then they get a leg up in admissions, they're trying to end that by basically not having anybody do calculus. So it just builds on these existing bad classroom practices. Most of these date back to the era of um, the, the 1992 math wars. A new one, though, is social promotion. The idea that all students are just going to go up to the next grade and easier material, lower standards. And, and they view grading and academics as gatekeepers, not something that you use as a, as a valid approach to measure learning, but just something that's being used to keep people out. So, uh, so even in high-performing districts, this is happening. And so if you think you're in a high-performing district, both Sugi and I are in top state-rated districts, Piedmont, Unified, and La Cañada. But this is all happening, and you need, you need um, extra support if you're going to get around it. So, so really, the short answer for how we can fix it, we need to teach the, fix the teaching and the philosophy, philosophy, more explicit instruction, and logically sequenced step-by-step -step coverage. Technology doesn't replace the need to teach, despite what these frameworks say. Uh, and they say this is all about modernizing the curriculum, and it's just really false when you look more closely at it. Um, so the teaching and the philosophy are what we need to fix. Uh, this is just sort of a repeat of what I said, but we really do need to restore academic growth and development as the primary goal, rather than this idea that everybody stays together and they're kept together the whole time. Um, and so our responses here are parents, take ownership of your child's math education, School boards understand that the tools you use to evaluate, the most common ones, are biased to follow the state. So, so be, be advised, be aware, use discretion. Same for administrators. Uh, and teachers need to be made more aware. So our goal as a group is to, to build this awareness among parents, teachers, all the stakeholders, so that they can see through the faulty research. Um, and that's how we get better. These are just sort of recaps of what you know, don't, don't take away calculus, put algebra one back in eighth grade. Um, if you hold students back, it just sends them to private tutoring. And there's companies that have been very successful doing that. And um, there's an old report that talks about best practices which have been ignored. So don't be fooled. And that's what I have. Thank you. Let me just say uh, that, uh, you know, all of the things that were presented here by Sugi and uh, by Mike, I, I mean, actually, I've been involved in some of that stuff. So in 1997, when the Standards Commission first uh, approved good standards for the 14 years you were talking about, I was actually the first person to testify in front of that commission. And so um, anyway, unfortunately, they forgot. <laughs> and so I'd like to have Becca Sinclair now uh, talk about reading. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here today. I love that I'm getting to um, finish off this amazing conference. Um, you will hear, as it relates to reading, a lot of the same themes that we've heard with this um, math presentation. However, um, there is a reason to be hopeful with reading. And um, I'm excited to be able to end this presentation on a note of hope and optimism. Um, I am an accidental policy analyst. I am the story of one of those moms whose jaw dropped to the floor when I saw what my young children were learning during the pandemic. Um, I saw a very illiberal ideology being taught to them at a very young age. And when you see um, bad policy impacting your kids, it's the most motivating force for a parent. And it's a very exciting time in education right now because you're seeing a lot of accidental policy analysts pop up and get involved. Um, so with that, I'm gonna talk to you about reading. I have four young children and I have been able to watch um, my two older children be taught reading with a very flawed um, reading approach. And it's been interesting because the approach has changed and my um, third son has been taught in a, in a newer science of reading approach, and it's been fascinating to see the difference, and I'll get into that. Um, so as Lance and these gentlemen highlighted, there is clear proof of instructional failure in our state, in our country. 
According to a 2020 Gallup analysis, more than half of all Americans aged 16 to 74 read below a sixth grade reading level. Um, and in this, this chart highlights California reading scores for third graders. And the main takeaway of this chart is that there is a clear equity issue. As much as we hear about the buzzword of equity in education, um, this reading chart just highlights the, um, the main impact to the most vulnerable children in our system. And as these gentlemen highlighted, the reason that we see this difference between low-income students and non-low-income students is because the non-low-income students have parents who can supplement failed reading curriculum. So they can hire private tutoring, they can invest in early literacy, uh, they can help get their children up to benchmarks um, where unfortunately our least vulnerable are left behind. So how did this happen? Um, again, historically, you'll hear about a lot of the same themes that we heard about in the math discussion, but I wanted to go back to the basics real quick and talk about exactly how kids learn to read. So this is called the simple equation for reading. Um, and it basically says that reading comprehension, which is the goal in the pink circle, is the product of two things. The first be, being a student's ability uh, to recognize words, so word recognition. And word recognition is simple decoding, being able to look at a word and know what it is, times language comprehension. And language comprehension is a student's ability to apply meaning to that word. Language comprehension is very dependent on a student's background knowledge, which is more tied to socioeconomic status. So background knowledge is dependent on how often that child was read to in the home, how many, how many books they had in the home, if their parents bathed them in a large vocabulary. Um, but word recognition, Word recognition and teaching word recognition is an area where schools can make the biggest impact on the reading level of our students. And unfortunately, as you see, due to mostly ideological um, teaching practices that began in the 1960s, our schools have been getting it so wrong and the results have just been disastrous. So I wanted to show you real quick um, a little video that highlights how we teach students to read using the science of reading. So um, phonics has historically been the classical approach to teaching word recognition, primarily through decoding. As you will see in this video, words are made up of letters and those letters make sounds. And, and this was probably the way you all learned how to read. Um, we teach kids from the bottoms up with very explicit and systematic instruction in the identification of sounds. Um, and when a student comes to a word and is struggling in a text, they are told to sound it out. So this is an example of a phonetic way to teach word recognition. Now, what we do is, first we cover up everything but the C. And your child is learning their letter sound, so he or she says, and have them say it clearly and loudly. And then the vowel gets stressed. And ah, ah. don't let them do anything else yet. Just ah, ah. and then finally at the ending. Ah. So you get the gist. <laughs> um, so this is the correct way to teach word recognition. Um, a lot of research in the 80s and 90s in the, the areas of cognitive science have proven that this is the correct approach. However, due to progressive education trends starting in the 1960s, um, educators started to de-emphasize the need to teach reading in a very structured way by sounding out words. Instead, they focused on a new theory called whole language, which is basically a top-down approach to reading that says we don't need to worry about sounding out the words. The end goal is meaning. So as long as students can get to the meaning, that's all that matters. 
And how do they get to the meaning? Through word investigation. So they look for clues or cueing on a page to try to infer what the word is. So they could look at pictures on the page. They could look at the first letter of the, the word, um, the other words in the sentence. It's a very inefficient and ineffective way to teach reading. Um, this, this is an example of how reading is taught um, using this cueing approach, and um, it's part of what has been a very popular balanced literacy framework. Theme, structure, and visual. When readers think meaning, they look at the picture and think about their background experiences to make an educated guess. The reader would ask himself, what would make sense here? For example, if you were stuck on the following word, you would read, I can go down the hill in my little red, hmm, in my little red bicycle? No, that's a wagon. I can go down the hill in my little red wagon. Now you won't wonder why students in this country can't read. Um, it's actually very shocking. This approach to reading instruction was used in our very fancy school in Marin County um, when we used to live there. My daughter told me in kindergarten that her kindergarten teacher had the class make wands and decorate them with streamers and glitter and then use those wands on the page to look for clues. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to tell you how much we paid for this school. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Um, and this school would also fundraise from parents to send teachers to Columbia Teachers College, which educated these teachers in this failed approach. It was a very progressive, um, a very progressive approach to reading. I have so many friends who had to pay thousands of dollars for their children to actually learn how to read the correct way over the summer in addition to their private school tuition. Um, reading instruction was so flawed in Marin County that a private school for dyslexia popped up in the 2010s. Um, dyslexia is real, but the rates that children were being diagnosed in Marin County uh, created the demand for a private school for dyslexia. So that, that was the impact that I saw firsthand of this failed approach to reading instruction. Now what's really frustrating is in the 80s and 90s, there was a tremendous amount of research that discredited this whole approach. It started under President Clinton, and then we saw uh, President Bush had his Reading First initiative, which was purely based on phonics and the science of reading. Unfortunately, though, as we learned in math, the power of these teachers' colleges and the power of this progressive ideology just spread uh, like wildfire. So these policies largely failed. And um, in the 2010s, my children were being taught reading in a very failed way. Um, a key theme that we've heard at this conference is that when systems do not have any mechanism for accountability, which are most of the areas of policy discussed today, um, bad ideas can spread like wildfire. And those bad ideas um, usually benefit special interests. So there was a lot of money behind this failed approach to reading. Um, so this map here shows the impact of two, um, two expert reading specialists and where they were able to sell their textbooks nationwide. Lucy Calkins and Fountas and Pillanel were very popular authors. Uh, these two authors were used at um, my children's private school in Marin. And throughout the 2010s, they were able to rake in $1.6 billion in textbook sales. They both eschewed phonics in favor of this cueing approach to word recognition, and they rose to celebrity status. Again, Calkins was a celebrity professor at the Teachers College of Columbia. She would take educators from around the country and put them through her reading and writing workshops over the summer. Um, Thankfully, 
during the pandemic, um, parents started to ask a lot of questions. And I said at the beginning that this is a story of hope. Um, it took an investigative journalist named Emily Hanford uh, to really dig in in an amazing podcast that if you're interested in this topic, I recommend. It's called Sold a Story. Uh, she really exposed how the influential authors promoted a bad idea and how schools and parents are reckoning with the consequences. Children were harmed, money was wasted, and an education system was upended. Media reports followed, and parents started pressuring schools to change their approach to reading instruction and literacy. I'm hoping the same thing can happen in math. So this one podcast really did an amazing expose, and you can see headlines from newspapers that um, then disseminated the message I know um, Marin schools, they reset their approach to reading instruction. Uh, you see the New York Times covered this as well as other independent news outlets. So it really did reach a broad audience. Um, and, and that's what it takes. That what, that's what it really takes to be able to hold the system accountable and to advocate for your kids. Now, another um, area of hope, I know we talked a lot about ballot initiatives. But once this story came to light, there has been legislative action. And just this month in California, a bill was proposed, AB 2222, and it sets a literacy policy agenda for the state. It's centered on three priorities, access to instructional materials that adhere to the science of reading, professional development, and training for current educators. And then it really aims to get into those teachers' colleges that incubated this bad idea on reading instruction. And it aims to effectively train teachers. This bill is a great start. Again, I'm hoping that we can see similar action in math someday. We need continued advocacy for evidence-based instructional practices in our schools. We need ad advocacy for transparency, and we really need to hold these systems accountable, especially to the special interests that, that, um, that dominate them today. Now, my last note of hope, I know um, this, this was a very wonky presentation following the stories of the DAs, but <laughs> last night I'm um, helping to organize school board races in Newport Beach. And I met with a deputy, deputy DA who's interested in running for school board. And he wants to get in there and prosecute the entrenched bureaucrats and hold them accountable for what they have done to his kids. 